Our gospel message for today comes from Luke chapter 14, verses 7 through 14. Listen now for, to these words from our Lord. When Jesus noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you're invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, she would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He also said to the one who invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers and sisters or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The words of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most holy God, in the banquets of our lives, we often attend with family, with friends, with brothers and sisters, Notably absent, often are the poor, the crippled, the lame, the stranger. For it is uncomfortable for us to show such radical welcome to those whom we don't know. And yet you, O oh God, call us to be radically welcome, to reach out to those who do not run in our circles, to those who may be left out, left behind, isolated. So, oh God, shape our hearts and our minds and give us the courage to open our own arms wide as you opened yours for all creation and all people. Help us to become people who radically welcome all others. In Christ's name, amen. Once upon a time, a little girl asked her dad when the family was leaving church, Daddy, why does God hate other people? Well, what do you mean, sweetie? Well, Pastor Lisa, Pastor Lisa said God hates it when we don't follow the Bible. And the Bible says to go to church, she says. So does that mean that God hates grandma? <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> the, the baby said no. <laughs> and she's right. <laughs> An angry, revengeful but also best friend and all loving God doesn't make sense to this make-believe little girl. And it doesn't add up for many very real, now grown adult boys and girls around the world. And it hasn't made sense throughout our Christian tradition as many theologians have struggled with this very same debate. And this is just one of the many narrative questions about scripture and belief that the church must answer. For if we are going to proclaim the radical welcome of God, we need to be able to proclaim that God is truly welcoming and inclusive and doesn't exclude eternally permanently. The way of Jesus is at the root of what it means to be radically welcome. As we embark 
on our Matthew 25 covenant journey as a congregation, as a community church, one person asked, well, is this just another church gimmick, a church marketing scheme, a, a way to grow? And the answer to that is no. This is rooted in our biblical foundation. It is getting back to who we have found God to be in the person of Jesus Christ. It is about practicing God's radical welcome. So let me define that radical welcome and its biblical roots before I get into the marketing problem of the church. So just what is radical welcome? Stephanie Spellers, in her book by that name, Radical Welcome, says, most people hear the term welcome, and they think it's about having a warm, dependable welcome at the door of the church and a really good cup of coffee and snacks in the church hall. They assume it's the province of the greeters committee or maybe just maybe the outreach and, and justice group. And those are wonderful goals to make people feel welcome upon their arrival. But that's not where radical welcome in the Matthew 25 movement is aiming. It goes beyond inclusion. It goes beyond welcome statements and hospitality practices. It is rooted in the open arms of Christ, reconciling the world to God. So just look at the words, radical and welcome. Both are rich with meaning. Welcome says, come in, sit down, stay a while. We are honored to have you here. We are glad you are here. It also says, the door is open. Make yourself at home. It's kind of like saying, help yourself to whatever is in the fridge or in the freezer, in the kitchenette, where we keep the cookies. It indicates an openness of spirit that what we do, that this welcoming is a pleasure. When someone thanks you for a gift or a kind gesture, you say, you're welcome. And it communicates graciousness and ease and allows the other person to receive with equal ease and grace. But there is more to radical welcome. As the word radical signifies, Radical in this instance should not connote the unreasonable, undisciplined action some people associate with the term. Instead, radical amplifies the welcome, broadening and deepening and launching it to the next level. Radical indicates a deep, fierce, urgent commitment to a core ideal. And that's not just any ideal, but for us, it's the one at the root of our tradition. It is a movement, and in our case, it is our faith. As Bill Tolley, rector of St. Barlamuse, says, radical is Jesus. Radical is getting back to our roots. In Scripture, at its roots, reveals the nature of God to us through the person of Jesus Christ. This revelation is the divinity of Scripture. This is what makes Scripture holy and sacred. The Bible points away from its own pages to Jesus, who welcomed all with wide open arms on the cross. It is through this revelation where we also find the fierce, urgent commitment to radical welcome. 
let me share some passages with you that illustrate just how radical Jesus was with this welcome. Perhaps most famously, this is found in Romans 5 and in its mirror passage, 1 Corinthians 15, where it says, Adam caused all to die, but in Christ, all will be made alive. And in Colossians 1, the Christ hymn, it tells a story that's very Christ-focused that begins with the creation of all things in heaven and on earth, all that is visible and invisible, and moves through God reconciling all things. The same all things again, namely everything, everything that has been created. And this is done through Christ's bloodshed on the cross. And for all the world, this is about reconciliation. This is a term that Paul always uses positively and salvifically in terms of the restoration of all relationships back to God, where they had their beginning. We see this radical welcome expounded on in scripture with some of the passages that we all know so well, like 1 John, where it says, God is love. And if God is love, then how could some be eternally left out? Or Romans 5, 8, that says, God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, not when we had repented, not when we had asked for forgiveness, not when we had changed our ways, but in the midst of our own wilderness wanderings, Christ opened his arms for us to come home. As theologian Peter Enns puts it, Making peace through his bloodshed on the cross doesn't sound like sending people to hell. It sounds like radical welcome. So there are texts like those, which in the early church were very influential in how people reached out to their neighbors. It shaped the action of the early church community. They understood that in all things, God would be present. That one day, God would be all in all. That one day, God would redeem all. For that is the promise of scripture. And that entails the salvation of all things. Because how could God be all good and victorious if God said God would reconcile the world, even defeating death, even defeating sin, how could we say that God is all good, God is all powerful, God is all loving, and God will be victorious if God cannot reconcile the world to God's self. This is the root of radical welcome. To say otherwise, to say that God isn't these things, that God cannot be victorious, that God will not reconcile all things to God's self, is to say that God is a liar. To say that some are left out, to say that God is angry at grandmas or people of other faiths or people who practice their Christianity different than us, people who don't repent, can't be reconciled, is a way of saying there is no victory for God, that Christ's love does not win. And so we proclaim 
radical welcome in the tradition of scripture. And the impulse behind this movement moves beyond inclusion. It moves beyond nice welcoming statements or ideals. And it takes its root in our beliefs about divine goodness, about God's ability to be victorious. And it's these kind of things, when you put them together, that make it difficult to think how eternal damnation and people being left behind even fits in our story. And yet, it's there. It's in scripture. Both of these belief traditions are right there. There are scriptures about universal salvation, about radical welcome, and there are scriptures about eternal hell. And we have to honestly struggle with those. As one theologian answered this, he said, when we think about the torment that we may face with judgment, that it is not just for retribution from God. That would not serve the definition of an all-loving God. A purely retributive punishment that served no redemptive, no redemptive good would not be appropriate for an all-loving God. He says, instead, God's punishment has an educative function and is often self-inflicted. God's punishment, God's wrath, sets off alarm bells for many of us. Because we ask, like that little girl, what does it mean for a perfectly good or perfect loving God to be wrathful? And we struggle. And the church has been divided on this answer since the very beginning. Some saying that we ourselves are the ones who feel alienated from God. That this feeling says nothing about God. It says something about us. And that when we say that we want others to be excluded or that they will be excluded because they're not like us, it says something about our power and our belief not about what scripture says ultimately about God. So the language about God's wrath, as we've interpreted it in the Reformed tradition, is actually a way of talking about how it is analogous to feeling like someone is angry with you. But as N says, it's not telling us anything about what God's feeling. It's talking about you. It's talking about what we feel from a human perspective when we see others left out or when we feel that we ourselves are left out. So maybe another way of putting it is that we have a marketing problem in the church. The church, as in we, the people, the hands and feet and head and heart of the body of Christ, we have some work to do if we are going to share the good news of Jesus Christ. I was looking at some remarks from some polls based on the Pew Research Studies and the Barna Studies about church membership and church attendance. And there's a group of people in our country that are called the nuns. These are not the ladies who used to wear the habits. These are the nuns, the nuns and duns, the ones who have never gone to church and may never go, go to church. And they answered why on some of these polls. Some said the church is exclusive, angry, 
and full of money scandals and sexual abuse. Others said the church is too political one way or the other. National politics, conservative or, li or liberal, drive the agenda. And others say they don't need the church to be good. And honestly, I don't blame them for being skeptical of any church's advertising efforts. A 10-year-old can sense the bait and switch that's left unsaid with church branding. Come to the world's greatest event that will change your life forever. But the consequences never end if you don't. It feels like there's a looming darkness in that marketing scheme. But we proclaim something bigger than that. That God, through the person of Christ on the cross, radically welcomes all that God has ultimate victory. That is, we have such a high view of Jesus that we don't worry about people's salvation because if the scriptural witness is true, they are already in. And Christ is standing there with wide open arms, always waiting for them to accept and to come in where they belong. Our job is to invite them, is to welcome them, is to open our arms and wait. And what if they never come? Then Jesus says, you go, you go to them. I don't like to use fear as a marketing ploy. I think people can see through it. But I believe, however, that we should be scared. That we should sometimes use fear as a motivator because it works. Because if we, as in you, us, as a particular body of believers, don't shop, start shouting from the rooftops that God is truly radical in his welcoming. If we don't live and act in accordance with our belief, if we don't take back the narrative and work for reconciliation for the harm that the church has caused with that theology, then there will not be a church in 20 years to counter the exclusive message of hyper-reactive Christianity and a modern heretical belief in an angry, vengeful God. Grandmas will be condemned and bombs will be dropped in the name of Jesus if we don't tell the whole true story of the good news. And we don't do this for our own glory. We don't do this so that this particular body grows. We do it to point to the glory of God, to point to the one we call peace, to proclaim that in God's radical welcome, there will be a time when the technology and money and training and innovation that we use to create weapons for war will instead be harnessed for things like feeding the hungry, caring for the poor, providing health care, and taking care of our problems. Things rooted in God's radical welcome, love, and care for all creation. Radical welcome. Radical welcome. Welcome. Matthew 25. This church is in a war for the heart and soul of Christianity. We have lost a lot of battles in the 80s, in the 90s, in this century. But research shows that there has been a momentum shift. People like that little girl are asking the right simple questions about God and they are finding answers when a little child is asked, will God hate grandma? And they say, no. 
and they're looking for a place where they belong. May you proclaim that this is that place. In Christ's name, amen.